Hey guys, welcome to Learn Today IGCSE. This is the second part of the video. Question 5. A light independent resistor LDR has a low resistance in high light intensity and high resistance in the dark. We have four types of resistors. Fixed resistor and variable resistors has a directly proportional relationship. However, light dependent resistor and thermistor resistor are inversely proportional, meaning that more light you get lower resistance. And for thermistor, the higher the temperature, the lower the resistance and vice versa. Part 1. Sketch a graph resistance y-axis against light intensity x-axis. So when the light intensity is low, you've got a high resistance. And when the light intensity is high, the resistance is low. So you will get an inversely proportional graph, which looks like this. Next question, part B. Figure 5.1 shows part of the electric circuit used to turn on a light when it is dark. So remember, when it is dark, the light-dependent resistor receives low intensity of light, which results in a high resistance. Okay, question part 1. Complete the circuit in figure 5.1 with the symbol for a light-dependent resistor. Make sure you memorize all the electrical symbols in your course syllabus. And as for light-dependent resistor, this is what it looks like. Next question, part 2. Explain why the lamp is off in the light and the lamp is on in the dark. Use ideas about potential difference in your answer. Okay, what we see here is actually a setup of a potential divider and I'll explain to you. We've got here two resistors, fixed resistor and LDR, connected in series. And let's say each of them are of the same resistance. And if I've got 10 voltage, then each of these resistors will receive 5 voltage each. And if I attach another component, for instance a lamp in this case, in parallel to my resistor, the lamp will also receive 5 voltage. So the lamp will only get as much voltage as the component parallel to it. So now the voltage of this lamp will be controlled by the voltage passing through the LDR. When the light intensity increases, we know that it will have a low resistance. So now imagine, if the resistance here decreases, then the amount of voltage it gets will also decrease. According to Ohm's law, V equals to I times R. So if I reduce the resistance, then the voltage will also reduce. So if the resistance decreases, then the voltage crossing the component will also decrease. And since the lamp is opposite the LDR, the lamp will also get a low voltage. So to explain, we will say that in the light, the resistance of the LDR is low. So most of the potential difference goes to the fixed resistor. Most of the potential difference will be given to the fixed resistor because the potential difference for the LDR decreases. Therefore, the lamp gets lower potential difference. So the lamp is off. And for the dark, it's just vice versa. Next, question 6. Question 6 is from chapter 3 V. Figure 6.1 shows an object O which is 5 cm away from the center of a thin converging lens. So the distance of the object to the center of the lens is 5 cm. And the focal length is 3 cm. Now focal length is the length between the center of the lens and the focal point. Question A part 1. On figure 5.6, label the principal axis with a P. So the long line we see here is your principal axis. And place a letter X at a focal point. So they want you to label it as X. And lastly, draw two rays from O to locate the tip of the image produced by the lens. To draw the image, we first must draw a parallel line with the principal axis from the tip of the object to the center of the lens. And from there, which is the center of the lens, you have to draw a straight line that passes through the focal point. And the third line, we're going to start from the tip of the object going through the center of the lens until it intersects the second line. And in this case, it intersects over here. So this is the position where the image would fall. Next question, part 4. In table 6.1, place a tick in the right-hand column next to all the terms that describe the image in A part 3. So as we can see here, the image is inverted as the tip points to the bottom. It's larger than the object, so it's enlarged. And since it falls on the right side of the lens, that would be drawing the letter R, you would get real. Can help you to identify that everything on your right is real. So enlarged, inverted and real. Next question part B. The object moves closer to L. 
the new distance between L and the object is less than the focal length. Describe how the image is different from the image in part A poll. Okay, so if the object moves closer to the lens, the focal point is here, and it says that the object is closer to the lens compared to the focal point, so we can just estimate that it's somewhere here. As previously, the first line always goes straight to the center of the lens. The second line goes from the center of the lens through the focal point. And the third line goes from the tip of the object through the center of the lens. And you just have to extend it. As you can see in this case, these two lines now do not intersect. So that means we need to backtrack this line and we will see that. The image falls on the left side of the lens. The right side of the lens gives us real images and the left side of the lens gives us a virtual image. So this is virtual and it's also the opposite side of the principal axis making it upright. So the new image is different in a way that it is upright and virtual. Next question 7 is from chapter 3 waves. Figure 7.1 is a scale drawing of light waves approaching a narrow slit. And part 1, name the wave effect produced by the narrow slit. Okay, waves passing through a gap will be diffracted as it goes out. So the effect here is called diffraction. Next part 2, using figure 7.1, determine the wavelength of the light. Give your answer in two significant figures. According to the measurement provided in the image, the gap is 1.2 cm and the scale states that every 1 cm is 4.0 times 10 to the power of negative 7. In two significant figures would be 4.8 times 10 to the power of negative 7 and the unit for wavelength is in meters. Next part 3, draw three wavefronts that have passed through the narrow slit. Now the size of the gap is approximately the same as the wavelength. So that means your diffraction would be curved like this. If the gap is much larger than the wavelength, then the wave diffracted would be slightly less curved. So in this case, you can draw three semicircle lines. Remember that the wavelength before and after the gap should be the same. Next question B. A fog horn emits a sound with a frequency 380 hertz. The sound is heard by a ship 2.5 kilometers away and the speed of the sound is 330 meters per second. State the wavelength of the sound is approximately 0.9 meters and state any equation you use. To find wave, we're going to use the formula velocity equals to frequency times wavelength. So rearranging this, we would get velocity over frequency. The velocity we have is 330 meters per second and the frequency given is in hertz. When you use this formula, make sure that everything is in standard unit. Your speed must be in meters and second and the frequency has to be in hertz. If anything otherwise, be sure to convert it. Just put this value in your calculator and it will give us approximately 0.9 and the unit will be in meters. Next part 2, calculate the time it takes for sound to travel to the ship from the fork horn. So what we have here is velocity, distance and we're looking to find time. Rearranging this formula, we would get distance over speed. The distance of the ship from the fork horn is 2.5 kilometers and the speed given to us is 330 meters per second. So that means your distance of 2.5 kilometers has to be converted into meters, which will be by multiplying 1000, which gives you time in two significant figures, 7.6 and the unit would be seconds. Next, question 8 is from chapter 4. Figure 8.1 shows a metal rod suspended in the magnetic field produced by a pair of permanent magnets. The metal rod is connected to a cell and there is a current in the metal rod. Question A. State the direction of the force on the metal due to the current. So if you see a battery, then you know that we've got a DC motor. And DC motor means we need to use our left hand Fleming rule to identify the force. Before we identify the force, let's identify the magnetic field. Magnetic field always goes from north to south. And the current flow is from positive terminal going into negative terminal. And if you are asked to label the flow of electron, then it will be from the negative terminal entering the positive terminal. So this means that the current 
iron is flowing into the page. So using your left hand Fleming rule, we're going to place our index finger pointing to the right side which indicates north to south. And as the current flows into the page, the middle finger will flow away from us. And this gives our thumb downwards which indicate the force. So the direction of the force is downwards. And for the explanation, you can use your Fleming's left hand rule to explain. Question B. The connections to the cells are reversed. State how this change affects the force on the metal rod. So if the current is reversed to the opposite direction, then the force will also be on the opposite direction, in this case upwards. Next question C. Two magnets and a cell are used to make a simple electric motor as shown in figure 8.2. You are asked to describe the function of parts J, K, L, and M. So I've written for you all the functions and the name of the parts and I think you can go through them by yourself as these are all theoretical questions and I don't think there's any explanation needed. Next, question 9. Strontium-90 is a radioactive isotope of strontium. The nuclide notation for strontium-90 is 90 on the top, which represents the nuclear number. Nucleon number is proton number plus neutron number in the nucleus of an atom. And at the bottom here is our proton number in the nucleus of an atom. Question A part 1. Explain what isotopes are. Isotopes are elements of the same proton number but different neutron number. Question part 2. Complete table 9.1 for strontium-90. Okay, if it's outside of the nucleus, then the particles would only be electrons because electrons are placed on the shell of the atom which is outside of the nucleus. And the next you've got neutrons. Neutrons can be found inside of the nucleus. And the number of neutron in this atom can be found by using the nucleon number minus the neutron number which is 52. And another particle that can be found inside the nucleus and has 38, it would be the particle of proton. Next question B. Strontium-90 is used to measure the thickness of metal sheets in industry. Strontium-90 decays by emitting beta particles which pass through a metal sheet to a detector. So the strontium-90 would release beta particle and since beta particle can penetrate aluminium, it will penetrate the aluminium and the detector would detect it. And that is how they measure the thickness. And if the thickness is a little bit more thicker than it's supposed to be dimension, then the alpha particle will not be able to pass through and the detector will detect that. So that's how they usually measure the thickness. Question part 1. One metal sheet is 0.75 mm thick suggests why strontium-90 is suitable radioactive source to measure the thickness of the metal sheets. This is because it emits beta particles as being mentioned which can pass through aluminium or metal sheets. And for another mark, you can also mention that it is less ionizing, hence it is more suitable. Next question part 2. The half-life of strontium-90 is approximately 27 years. So for strontium to become half, which is 50, it would take 27 years. And halving 50 into 25, that would take another 27 years. So it's 54 years later. Okay. The strontium-90 is replaced with a new source after 15 years. Using figure 9.1, suggests why a strontium-90 source that is more than 50 years old needs to be replaced with a new source. Okay, let's look at our graph. At 15 years, the percentage of strontium-90 remaining is less than 75%. So if it's less than 75%, then the radiation may become too weak so there will be fewer beta particles emitted. So this means that now it might not measure the thickness of the metal surface accurately. And the last question 10, figure 10.1 shows the path of the Earth as it orbits the Sun. X is a position on the Earth where scientists observe the apparent motion of the Sun throughout the year. Determine how many days it takes the Earth to move around its orbit from F over here to G. All right. A full complete circle is going to take 365 days. And as you can see from this position, from F to G, it's a quarter of a circle. So the number of days would just be a quarter times 365 days, which is 91.25. So I will just write it as 92 days. Next question B. Figure 10.1 shows four positions E, F, G, and H and we are asked to identify the position of the Earth when it is summer at X and winter at X. And actually we can see it from the diagram that at position E, X is the brightest. So this indicates that over here is summer and the opposite over here is the winter. Next question C. 
The orbital speed of the Earth around the Sun is approximately 3 times 10 to the power of 4 meters per second and we are asked to calculate the average radius. So the formula for this is orbital speed equals to 2 pi r divided by t. The velocity is 3 times 10 to the power of 4 and since we are looking for radius, we'll leave that as our unknown. And since the speed is measured per second, so our time also has to be in second. The time taken for Earth around the Sun is 365 days. So this means that we have to convert 365 days multiplied by 24 hours, 60 minutes and 60 seconds. And now rearranging the formula, the radius would be 1.5 times 10 to the power of 11 and the unit is meters. Next question D. Earth is a planet in the solar system. State one other type of naturally occurring object that is present in the solar system. So you can mention any one of this. Alright guys, that's all for this video. Thank you so much for watching and supporting my channel. I really appreciate that. Good luck for your examinations and if you have any questions, just ask me in the comment sections below. Bye!